And who most influenced you as a filmmaker? Was it Kubrick or? Clockwork Orange was a big influence. That was, hu that was huge. When I did mean, you see it? Back when it came out. And, and um, you know, it was one of those movies. It's one of those movies that once having seen it, for me, I can always rem uh, remember almost every part of the movie cut for cut, particularly the first half, mm -hmm. which I thought was so vivid. And, and that was the great thing about Stanley Kubrick. Somehow he was able to create images which once seen, never forgotten. They somehow sear, sear themselves into the brain. And they're just, they're just uniquely his vision. And, and you see them. And so whenever I watch, you know, if I watch, I, I, I watch something like Clockwork Orange, and it's almost as though uh, I don't need to watch it over and over because I just know every shot, every gesture, every bit of, a bit, a, a bit of the, the, the music and so on. Um, I, um, but, but you know, the, the the filmmakers that influence you. When I really became interested in cinema, um, I, it, it started with the silent filmmakers. I just remember I first saw Buster Keaton, and I thought, wow, this guy really, really knows, uh, uh, you know, what the potential of of classic montage filmmaking, you know, composition, how one shot flows to the next, and understanding in those chase films and those action movies he made, uh, uh, understanding that it could only exist in cinema. It yeah. could never exist in theatre or anywhere yeah. else. So they were the people who defined, defined it. And then for me, the, you know, the great pioneer, uh, not only because of the films he made, but because of the way he was able to articulate them, his process uh, so succinctly was it was Hitchcock, yeah. and um, and and but but then you know there's there's so many of them, uh, but but uh, so many of. You them. spoke to Kubrick at one point about pushing a digital initiative. Did you ever meet him? Never met him. Oh. But we had like Stanley Kubrick had lots and lots of conversations with people on the phone, and back when we were doing Babe. Um, we, we we didn't know how to make this pre digital. Didn't know how to make the pig speak. I, met, I knew that the story had to be done uh, re live action because it didn't lend itself to a cl kind of classic kinetic animation, cell animation. And there was a place called Newbury. You might know it. Mm -hmm. Not thirty miles. Not I think about thirty miles away from London, but in particular, I think it was about thirty miles away from where. Stanley Kubrick's uh, house was, and and there was a guy at at Quantel, this company in Newbury, Newbury. They were doing high, very it was analog, but it was very very high vision stuff, uh, military, medical, uh, and uh, and there was a guy there who was a kind of genius, uh, and they said, listen, if you can convince him, if you can uh, that he he might be able to help, and I suddenly occurred to me. My God! If you can get Stanley Kubrick and he together, they would push, push the technology because Kubrick pushed lenses, he pushed cameras, he pushed everything. And if they could get together, and and uh, so every night while I was there, they invited us into this place, Quantel, and uh, they uh, and we they're trying to figure out how to manipulate the the two D image to make make it look like talking. The, the mistake I was going, we were definitely going down the wrong track because it wasn't digital and would never have really, re really worked well. It would have looked artificial uh, ultimately. Uh, anyway, uh, it was organised for Stanley to come to this place and see what was happening because he was so interested in technology. And then his uh, daughter, um, uh, who is. At, a pregnant um, gave birth to a child on the on the day or two before he's oh. to come, and he had to go down to London. Oh. And they never got together. And I don't know whether much would have happened because of that digital thing. I think that was happening elsewhere. But did you talk to him on the phone then? Oh, endlessly, every night, because he. Wow. That's how he. That's how he. Would, about babe. Ab about everything. I I, I don't think I don't, I don't know. We, you know, I explain we're trying to make a pig talk. But we, he was particularly uh, caught up with this, uh, the technology of, of uh, you know, not uh, cutting on videotape. Mm. 
he 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 and and but he was one of those people who just would, would kind of sucked in the world by by, by conversations we we're having every night. He'd sit and talk for a long, long time and talk about the process. And I knew, um, I knew, I knew that he was very, very intri intrigued about what could could be happening. Uh, and of course, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure people know this. I, I, one of the fascinating things he told me he, he, about how he had, uh, if he he had readers who who were reading for him, but never knew it was Stanley Kubrick. So he would have, if he heard of a novel and, and someone, ha you know, look, looking for, for projects, if he heard of a novel, he would, um, he would send it out to people. Uh, I think he did it through newspaper ads at the time. And he would send it out to people and ask for uh, a, a kind of synopsis or a critique of the novel. And, uh, and, and he would read them. And it was done, I guess, anonymously. And he said there were housewives and there were barristers and there were all sorts of people doing that. And I thought, yeah, that's a really good way to open up the possibilities. Because otherwise, you, you, you know, you're know, you randomly walk, working, walking through a bookstore or But just imagine airport. for the reader who said, nah, nah, The Shining, don't, don't do this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, made a mistake there. <laughs>